wonderful good morning to you all. Today is Thursday of the World Health Diagnostic Awareness Celebration. We are graciously hosted by Sheila Loco University. My name is Katinka Dubalov. I'm the Senior Animal Health and Production Officer at the Food and Agriculture Organization based here in Bangkok in the regional office. I'm very happy here to be with the antimicrobial resistance and also special welcome to our partners from, from UNEP, from the UN Environmental Programme, and from WHO, who are also joining us today. We have a very exciting program. We have several presentations, but we want also to make it a bit interactive. So we will have something called summit. And I don't know if some of you were here yesterday. We already practiced a little bit with this. So the first day on Tuesday, we had the official launches of the World Antibiotic Awareness Week, and we also had the official uh, recognition of Chula Longhorn University as the Department of Veterinary Science, the Department of Veterinary Public Health of the Faculty of Veterinary Science, to become the FAO Reference Center for Antimicrobial Resistance. So this is the first center in the Asia. Our relationship with this important center has been now formalized with this recognition. Also, on the first day, we launched the first part of the surveillance and monitoring guidelines. Uh, we, we launched the one that deals with healthy animals that are being used for food production. And uh, we will be also today having several uh, sessions looking more on the practice. Yesterday, we had the whole morning for the students with the basic concept on antimicrobial resistance. So today, we will be going much more into the practical aspects, how to address, uh, how to mitigate the risk of AMR. So I will pass it over to Dr. Antiria to kind of also say a few words for this opening, and then I will go back into more the logistics of the day. a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, first of all, I would like to greet the honorary invited speaker and also to introduce Dave. Today, I think we have a very nice uh, lecture, especially Dr. Rama, Dr. Kakuko, uh, Dr. Joyce, Dr. Michelle, Dr. Hans Spring. I think all of the invited speakers, they are so informative learn a lot from for the Omaha. Uh, on behalf of the Federation of the Asian Veterinary Association, uh, right now I'm the director of the Flower Secretary Office based in Bangkok. I'd like to thank uh, AAO, especially Dr. Katinka, that uh, or Kai invited me to deliver a short uh, greeting and also opening speech for this uh, very important and very auspicious uh, activity for the AMR, especially in the World Antibiotic Awareness Week, which is very great and it is very wonderful activity for the, uh, I think for all the veterinarians and also among stakeholder, especially in the farming counter and livestock production. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate because uh, I think that she is very busy, especially for the therapy. She is my close friend and she is really have a very high efficiency to run the AMR center and of course uh, the faculty of basic science to work on university has been uh, declined and announced to be a reference center for the antimicrobial resistance for the, as a regional office for the Asia and Pacific. This is really a great pleasure to us, especially to see that there are so many things that happen, especially as a global uh, recognition, especially the FAO activity, and also tomorrow we will be 
be very uh, prestigious to welcome the Santa uh, uh, or Francis is uh, coming and visit to our God University. That is also a very wonderful activity for us. It is really the pride of to our God University. Yes, I think it's very important that what is for our uh, I would like to give you a break that right now we are working near four years of our uh, milestone for the Federation of the Asian Wrestling Association. Our mission is really would like to be a representative of the wrestling profession in the regional uh, context and also to be an educated uh, uh, thing that we would like to say to the world that what we are doing right now and the quality of life of the people in the region is uh, really exciting. Our next presidency is uh, our unified professional association. Uh, Fawa right now we have 21 members and uh, the last member is uh, Timor Leste. This is very small country in the Pacific Ocean. This is very nice for us that we have so many variety of the coming together in our society. Uh, since we have uh, announced our power strategy in Ho Chi Minh City for the 2016 to 2020, we emphasize and focus for the role of the wrestling profession in the White House. Especially, we also focus for the AMR uh, agenda. Uh, we have done of the series of the seminar together with a return trip to the AOR Center in Tulane College University in the VIP office each year. A seminar every two years in the mid Asia. And this year we have just had a meeting last March and of course in the city of AOR because we would like to, to emphasize to prove the mission that we would like to announce and to bring the recognition to the wrestling area in Asia. This is also one of the, our achievements for Asia. And of course, we also doing with the code of conduct of the Asian wrestling area and also for the ASEAN wrestling area. And one of the conduct for the ASEAN wrestling area is the role of the in the AMR, especially for the White House. Program. So I think this is something that we would like to say that we also would like to be one of the supporters for the AMR agenda in the region. Yes, I think we will into, uh, continue the, I mean, the activity, especially a very interesting uh, lecture the whole morning. I hope that you can play a lot and get so many back to your office and I hope that it is a it is a time for starting a very interesting and wonderful lecture for the AMR. So on behalf of Bawa I wish the technical seminar today uh, for the in the World Antibiotic Awareness Week 2019 uh, will have a very early success deliberation and look forward to more collaboration in the future ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sylvia, for your kind words. Thank you. Um, you see here, this is a webinar. So actually, this is being taped, and also this session, the sessions today, be looked back in the webinar. You will see that gradually people will be connected, so it's online, outside also of this room. Just to mention that outside is the photo exhibition, and this shows the combination of the close working together between Tula Longo University, the new FAO reference center uh, headed by Professor Rumsey, and the work of FAO. So please, I also would like to invite you in the break to have a look. Uh, at the, uh, at the um, photo exhibition. Let me 
As you mentioned also, we will be having some interactive sessions and you can see in the Kahoot. And not, do you all have a mobile phone with you? Yeah, I can see so. So I want to ask Sophie kindly to walk you through how we will be doing a test question before, before I pass it to the first presenter. So Sophie? Yes, so uh, please uh, go on your mobile phone and then uh, and then you can join at uh, www.kahoot.it and then when you're already there, uh, it will ask uh, the game pin and then you can enter uh, the pin and after you can enter your nickname. Yes, some people already done. Yes, so uh, this one is a, a trial question. So in the next session, after each uh, a pretender, we will have the, the serious uh, question where uh, the, the winner can get the special prize from Emmy. Okay. Uh, everyone uh, okay? 18, 19? More people? Yes. Okay, maybe 10 seconds. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, we start. There is there are two questions, and this is the first one. Every person is different, but just how much you do you differ genetically from other humans? 25%, 10 10%, 2%, 1, 0.1%. Yes, we have 20 participants. Yeah, 21. Okay. Yes. Zero point one percent. And then who is the me? <laughs> yes, so this this quiz is a combination with the speed and the, the 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 right when you when you answer right and then when you uh, click it very fast you will have the highest score. Point one percent. Yeah. As October twenty nineteen, Sai Gangnam Style, the most watched video ever on YouTube, has how many views? Wow, it's a very easy question. <laughs> Three. <laughs> okay, then we'll see. Yeah. Number three, peppermint. Yay. <laughs> number two, KK. Who's number one? Me. <laughs> yes, uh, for the next question, uh, will be according to the lecture. So please pay attention so you could answer the question. And it will be a present. Yeah. Okay, so the next question. At some point, we will also have the video of this year, so that is the way we have it after the first presentation. So, this is to be for the first presentation. Yes, I know. It will 
group is coming up for you. So the first presentation will be looking at alternatives to antibiotics, and it will be provided by Dr. Rama Mopi Haruki, who is visiting FAO from the UK, and he's with us for three weeks in the three months. He's a veterinarian with many years of experience in veterinary microbiology, public health, and diagnostics. And he is presently a senior veterinary microbiologist in a veterinary uh, diagnostic laboratory. And he's doing his PhD at the moment. So, working on antimicrobial um, alternatives and specifically on bacterial phages. So, he will present us not only on bacteria. Uh, good morning to everyone. So I'm going to present to you this morning about uh, alternatives to antibiotics. So the topic is quite broad but interesting. So I might I should start <laughs> right now. Please wait for. So um, the way I will present this um, presentation. So I will give you a brief overview of AMR and then I'll discuss to you some of these alternatives and then I will also introduce you to, to the topic of my research which, which is on your page or a bunch. And lastly, uh, I will give you some uh, information <coughs> information regarding a novel research that we are being, uh, that is currently being done our group, which is looking on bacterial sex or conjugation in order to uh, isolate a page that will tackle antimicrobial resistant bacteria. Okay, to start with, uh, I think most of you know this, so the WHO uh, recognized uh, AMR as a global threat, and in, two, and in 2014, the UK Parliament assigned Lloyd O'Neill, in fact, is an economist uh, to determine the economic impact of AMR. You know, as the same goes, money talks. So, you know, if it's converted to money, it's when we get the attention of our legislator. And one of his conclusions is that if we don't do anything about this problem, by 2050, uh, the world will cost up to 100 trillion US dollars um, regarding this problem of AMR. So the, protect, the problem of AMR can be attributed mainly to acquired resistance. So this is either to the acquisition or gain of resistant genes, to either conjugation or mutation. All right. I will start with an important piece of the puzzle of the problem of AMR. Actually, this concerns the Asia Pacific. Because in the past 20 years, there is a dramatic uh, change in the world where there is a growing appetite for animal protein in those to middle income countries. In fact, personally, I can attest to this. Going as a boy in the Philippines, I, only, I can only have an access to a meat dish once a month. But now, whenever I visit the Philippines, I can see, you know, my nephews and nieces, you know, a meat dish in the table is just a normal. So I'll give you some statistics on this. So since 2000, meat production has accelerated by more than 60% in Africa and Asia, and by 40% in South America. More than half of the world's chicken and pigs are in Asia. So there is a pressure to produce more meat to address this demand. So how this was addressed that in, in, in animal farming, the big objective is to reduce infection and increase body mass of 
lives up and fall. So what did they do? So what they do, what they did is to use antibiotics for growth promotion. Actually, when I was reading an important paper that was just published less than two months ago, which I hope will be a game changer, is that meat production actually accounts for 73% of global antibiotic use. Actually, even myself was quite shocked on this because this 73% is quite high. So this paper, so this paper that was that I was talking about is entitled Global Trends in Antimicrobial Resistance in Animal in Low and Middle Income Countries. Because this paper was published in science, so there so unfortunately, it received a lot of attention in the media. So this uh, paper is the first paper to tackle AMR in animals in North to Middle Income countries <laughs> from nearly 1,000 publications and unpublished webinar reports. So this is one of the aspects of the paper that I like because it also included those webinar reports that, that were unpublished. So the most significant findings of this paper is that occurrence of antibiotic resistance has nearly tripled in disease-causing bacteria within the period of 18 years in developing countries. So what this uh, value means? So this is that uh, antibiotics that could be used for treatment failed more than half the time since 2000 from 15% to 40% in chickens and from 10% to 30% in pigs, risk for human consumption. So, other findings that antibiotic resistance in life is most widespread in developing nations. So, there are also two factors why this is a problem. Because as you can see, this uh, explosion growth in meat production and consumption in the region, plus the fact that access to veterinary antimicrobials remain, remains largely unregulated, is a recipe for disaster if we don't address this uh, problem. So how did other regions or countries in the world address this? So the European Union is quite good at this, so as early as January 1st, 2006, so they banned those antibiotics that are used for growth promotion. And then after 16 years, the United States banned this. Um, as far as I know, based on my research, I might be wrong. We still have to wait for like an Asia-wide or a regional um, move to ban these antibiotics for growth promotion. So one way to um, one way to address this is the suggestion that we should have a sustainable uh, feed farm, uh, sustainable animal farms. And one of one of the components of this is through the use of non-antibiotic alternatives, which leads to my to the main topic of my presentation. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of ways. Where, uh, on how to classify these alternatives. But this classification, I like this because it addresses on how the antibiotics are being used. So based on the function of antibiotics, so we also classify the alternatives. So we have alternatives for growth promotion, alternatives for disease prevention, uh, and alternatives for disease treatment. And as I mentioned to you, the main driver of, of antimicrobial resistance is in fact the use of alternative for growth promotion. So I will give more time on that. Next slide, please. So just to give you some more statistics on this problem. So there was a research uh, done in 2017, <laughs> and their findings that more than 131,000 pounds of antibiotics were used in food animals worldwide, mainly as feed animals. And it's estimated to increase for up to more than 200,000 tons by 2030 if we don't do anything about this. Next slide, please. All right, so these are some of the, these of the non-antibiotic alternatives for growth promotion. 
some of it uh, we are already using, and fortunately, I think there is also increased use of this nowadays. So we have uh, probiotics, prebiotics, organic acids, phytochemicals, uh, and then we have also the enzymes, and we have the antimicrobial peptides, and we also have heavy metals and other uh, other types of metals such as the earth elements. So as you can see, I have to cover that, so I'll just mention some things regarding it. So probiotics, as you know, um, this could be either defined or undefined. So the most commonly used one, and actually the more effective, uh, are the undefined probiotics, meaning uh, the components of these probiotics are not well characterized. Uh, one example of these are the competitive exclusion products. So one of the constraints of this is that, as you know, for us to produce uh, feeds, usually uh, we produce pellets. Unfortunately, this has a temperature requirement, so this might uh, 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 this, uh, make this probiotic less effective. Uh, prebiotics, on the other hand, acts indirectly. So these are uh, organic compounds that we add to the feeds to, to uh, address the growth of uh, the beneficial bacteria uh, in the intestine. And then we also have the input enzymes that we added in order for, to digest those uh, substances that are undigestible. So by doing so, we can improve the gut microbiota and we also prevent further damage to the uh, intestine. So all of these three, basically they act on, they act by improving the gut health. So other uh, alternatives target uh, the bacteria directly. So this includes antimicrobial peptides, organic acids, phytochemicals, and heavy levels. So I'll just mention you two because I have a bit of experience. So in the past, I worked with antimicrobial peptides. So what I did is, before I start that, antimicrobial peptides are small molecules, and these are produced by bacteria, and, and which, which, can be, uh, which, which can inhibit the growth of other bacteria. So one example is bacteria. So what I did at the time, I tried to isolate bacteriocin from lactobacillus and isolate this bacteriocin and I tried to see whether this can inhibit the growth of Clostridium difficile. And heavy metals, on the other hand, this is now a bit problematic actually. Uh, so same with, with antibiotics. Recently, there's already a lot of report of metal resistant bacteria. Um, it's even more worrying because like one of my friends, what she found out is that she can uh, the plasmids that she that she recovered uh, it both it contains both uh, resistant genes for antibiotics at the same time resistant genes for metals. In fact in Europe there's already some move to ban the addition of heavy metals as speed additives and also the ban of adding these uh, metals to disinfectants. Next slide, please. So, the next group of alternatives um, uh, are used for disease prevention and treatment. So, I just prepared one figure for this uh, because there are two. Um, Alternatives that can be used for both disease prevention and disease treatment. So I will start with vaccines. So uh, because of the time limitation, so and I think most of us are familiar with this, so I won't uh, discuss that further. So but this is one of the alternatives that is widely used for disease prevention and uh, immune modulators. Uh, this can be used for both disease prevention and uh, this is treatment. So what are these? So just to give you a brief uh, definition of this, so these are chemicals or substances that directly stimulate the uh, immune system without relying on the uh, uh, disease-causing uh, uh, bacteria for the immune system to elicit the immune response. So there are also some alternatives such as those that can inhibit um, biofilm formation which is also a big problem with the fight uh, 
against antimicrobial resistance. And for this, actually, uh, we should not forget that still the best alternative for disease prevention is prison please. It's good for management and biosecurity. Actually, if we just observe this properly, we might not even need to use this alternative. So regarding the, uh, the alternatives for disease treatment, so I've already discussed with you the probiotics and antimicrobial peptides. And then there's also one exciting field where in, uh, this particular group of researchers, they investigated on this type of bacteria. They are predatory bacteria. So in one studies, they were in one of the studies, they were able to demonstrate that this uh, predatory bacteria prey on a uh, multi-drug resistant E. coli. And then, of course, bacteriophage, um, uh, we can use that both for disease prevention and treatment. Next slide, please. So before I proceed with my bacteriophage, I will just uh, generalize. So what are the constraints? So hopefully, in the next 10, 15 years, or even uh, sooner, uh, we can, you know, the people from the research institution can address this uh, constraint. So it's, it always was <laughs> So the efficacy of some of these alternatives actually are quite variable. So it's always a problem. And also, uh, they are affected by external factors, such as weather and heat consumption. And lastly, the mechanism of action for many of these alternatives are not still well understood. The problem with this is, you know, like for example, those uh, approving agencies such as FDA. Level. So if you apply for the approval, this uh, product, then you need to really show the exact mechanism of action of this uh, alternative. So hopefully, in the next uh, years, we will, uh, you know, we will have more ideas on this. So now I will introduce to you to bacteriophage. So when I'm doing this, I think, oh, the bacteriophage should need a better headline because, as you know, when the developed world discovered the antibiotics, so that was in the 40s, so they neglected the use of bacteriophage. That I may think, oh, who are these not, you know, people are not, you know, isolating these viruses in the river, seaweed, and, you know, injecting into human beings with this infection. But now, because there is this problem of multi drug resistant bacteria, so there's a massive uh, interest uh, with uh, it. So I titled it the comeback of the superbug fighting viruses. And Actually, the good thing with bacteriophage research is it always receives positive publicity, which is quite important. One of the high-profile cases is this case. This was, you know, because the book was published this year, so this is a case of an American couple that uh, had a trip in Egypt, and uh, and the husband was infected by a superbug, a multi-drug-resistant Acidobacter bovine. That time, there's no other options. Everything is not working, even the last resort of antibiotic policy. So what they did, because what they did is they got an access to to, to a page, and then and then yeah, and then after some time, the the husband uh, was treated. And in fact, it was uh, published into a book. And actually, I like the title, so the title is a perfect predictor. So what is page? So I'll just give you a background. So page or patch. Even in our group, there are like two people. Some pronounce it as a page, some pronounce it as a patch. So what, however you pronounce it, it's okay. So the important thing to know is it's an obligate intracellular parasite. So it's a parasite of bacteria. So this means that wherever there is a bacteria, most probably there will be page. And in fact, this is the most abundant organism on Earth. In fact, around 10 to the 31 particles. So, loads of zeros, 31 million. And classification is really based on morphology and electron microscopy. And it is quite more specific. Next slide, please. Okay, so with the page morphology, um, so. I'm pretty sure when I mentioned to you the page, you, you think of this morphology. But when in fact, there are, because 10 to the 31, right? 
So there are a lot of different types. So they, there are some spiritual pain, there are filamentous pain, there are keyboarding pain. And it can also be a DNA pain or RNA pain. So this one, this is actually I can call this as one of my babies. So I'll mention this to you later. So there is this RNA page, which is a single stranded RNA page belonging to family legendary. So how does this uh, page infect bacteria? So there are several ways, but again, because of the time limitation, I will just mention to you the cycle that we are most interested when we are looking for a page that can be used for therapy, etc. So this is the So this is the lytic page. So this is so when the page uh, infects a bacterial cell, so it attaches to a specific receptor. So most commonly it attaches to either the capsule or the, the cell wall, specifically the lipopolysaccharide, and then they inject their nucleic materials, and then there will be a, a production of virions or or you know the daughter uh, page, and then there will be uh, release and this will cause a uh, lysis of the whole cell. So as I mentioned to you before, it's only the Eastern European blocks that are interested in this. Actually, this is one of the fields that the Eastern countries are more advanced than the Western. Like Georgia, uh, 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 they are quite ahead of this because they didn't stop using bacterial And uh, So starting, you know, like in the 90s, there was like a massive, you know, like uh, Interest again with uh, bacterial page research. Actually, this is just 2016, but when I looked at it, the trend is still increasing. Next slide, please. So I'll just give you some of this um, work that uh, work that were done on both humans and animals that you know that that address some good drug resistant uh, bacteria. So you know it was proven effective for you know enterococcus tissue. Uh, you are, you also have that. Stuff or use and pseudomonas erythroloza, just to name a few. So, what are the advantages and disadvantages of page therapy? So, I really present it this way because you know, when you're designing your next step, usually it's always better to write the pros and cons and then compare the list. And then, if you have, you know, like compare the length of it. So, as you can see here, there are more advantages of, uh, I might be biased, but uh, this is based on publication. So, uh, so there are several advantages. So I mentioned this bacterial side of, and it, because it's a living organism, so it, it can increase in number. And importantly, this is non toxic, so it's not scary at all. So, it's not toxic both for humans and animals. And they, they just minimally disrupt the normal flora. Um, they have a narrow potential for inducing resistance, um, and then they, they lack the lack of cross resistance with antibiotics, and then they are easily discovered, they are versatile, and they can also have the potential to be used for uh, biofilm. So, some of the disadvantages not all patients are made for good therapeutics. So, this means that, you know. There are cases where you have to screen several pages in your library. And then in our whole space, this is the one that I mentioned to you. But in my research, I will show you that this can be also actually an advantage. And then pages are not really pharmaceutical and anti-familiarity with pages. So this one I think, you know, with the graph that I've shown you, now that there's a massive interest with page research, so hopefully this will be addressed in the new. Okay, so I was thinking like how can I present my research in a general audience? Because in the past I was really criticized for science is good but you're unreachable. So what I will do now is I guess you know let's say this is a movie. So I will call this film as like super bad words. Return of the page and the mission is to use sex field specific drive bacterial population towards the loss of antibiotic resistance. So of course in the film there will be bad guys and our bad guys are the resistant page. And why okay. 
Power. So this is this circular uh, DNA known as plastic. So actually, this is our problem. You know, in the fight of antimicrobial resistance, the spread of plastic from one bacterium to another, you know, is the main contributor of the spread of antimicrobial resistance. And I'm working with one type of plastic. It's called incompatibility as plastic. Uh, as you can see here. Some research done by a Dutch group where they investigated the genes that are being carried, recent genes that are being carried by the plastic. As you can see here, most of, of antibiotics uh, have been reported to be carried by this plastic. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the, this is the like USP, unique selling point of my research. So, how these plastic are being transferred from one bacterium to another. So have you seen the movie Alien? I, I suspect the writer of that, you know, pattern is because bacteria, they transfer this uh, plasmid from one bacterium to another through sex or technically through conjugation. So as you can see here, so this is an F plus uh, cell, so meaning it contains the plasmid. And then because this plasmid will produce this sex pillows, in order for this plasmid to be transferred from one bacterium to another. So just to you know just to make the story short, so at the end the product would be two bacteria cells containing that resistant plasmid. So my mission is I'm thinking if that's the mechanism of spreading uh, resistance, maybe I can look for a page that specifically attached to that structure. So what I did is, as I mentioned to you, so where is the best place to find this patient? Obviously, the place where our wall sheet, sorry, pieces uh, go. So I had a trip. So for one year, I became a page hunter. So I went to several uh, sewage treatment plants, collected sewage, trying to isolate this page. So after years, lot of work, so I have this I isolated this baby, so uh, my baby I put there. So the appearance looks boring. So it's one of those spirit, spiritual page. So this belongs to family Demiviridae, and it is very virus. And the important thing about this page is, I was able to demonstrate that this page is specifically attached to uh, sex feed. In fact, this figure actually is my result. So as you can see. Two pictures conjugating and then the page attacking. But how I can prove that you know they are killing the bacteria? So this is the first thing that I did. So I did the simple uh, growth curve. So why did this I infected uh, this uh, inner bacteria? And then I measured the tighter of the page, but at the same time I also measured the the tighter of my bacteria. And I even added, I also counted those bacteria that uh, lost their plastic. Because that's also an important aspect of, uh, of my research. So as you can see here, as the page tighter increases, the bacteria population decreases. Next slide, please. So this year, our group published a paper. So this is first in the world, uh, demonstrating that sex field specific page drive up your population towards antibiotic sensitivity. So what are the major findings? So it demonstrated that SPS, SPS page can kill AMR excretion coli, but more importantly, it can mediate AMR plastic loss in vitro. Because the problem with a plasmid is, I'm also wondering, you know, having a plasmid in your cell is another pressure, you know, for the bacteria, but why they are maintaining it? So we demonstrated that, oh, actually, when we use this plasmid, we, we were able to, the, the carriage of plasmid actually uh, decreased. And then for the first time, there was, uh, it demonstrated that SPS page can both prevent the spread of AMR, salmonella, and pterygidis infection in chickens and shift the bacteria population towards antibiotic sensitivity. 
So before I finish my presentation, I just would like to quickly acknowledge Dr. Katinka, thank you very much. We have been in contact since 2009. Thank you for making this happen. It's always my dream to, you know, like to bring, you know, my knowledge, you know, with, because uh, sometimes I think, oh, my science, I want it to be, you know, like appreciated by, you know, by the public. And I think the the work that's been done by FAO address on this, so it exceeded all my expectations. And I would also like to thank all the hardworking members of the FAO uh, RA. RMP, ARMP. And as a take home message, because already on the next slide, please, uh, of Star Wars. So there is this, uh, you know, Star Wars, the series, there is like an opening quotation. So I think we can apply this uh, with our fight uh, against AMR. So never give up hope, no matter how dark it is. So in the UK, they will tell you, oh, you're so easy. But who doesn't love cheese? Thank you very much. get some of a lot of uh, antimicrobial mm -hmm. resistant bacteria despite the presence of these pages. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually that's a perfect question. Actually it will be the next stage of my research. You know I'm always amazed with the relationship of bacteria and things. It's like you know with the slide that I presented it's really a battle because they are there these two are really out so you're correct. Uh, so why is it whether a lot of page why you were still able to isolate this bacteria? So the bacteria find a way uh, to you know to to prevent them by being attacked by being attacked with page. So what they did is they develop a mutation that will prevent them from producing sex genes. So you call this phenomenon as repression, and this is one of the things that I will. I will be looking at in the next stage of my research. Uh, yeah, good morning. I'm David Sullivan, WHO. Uh, thank you. It was a, a really nice presentation. I'm aware you might be biased in the answer that you're about to give. But I would just be interested with your background as to when we're thinking about going forward, is the long-term priority, the long-term solution in trying to find
interesting uh, lecture. I, I, I would like to ask you that right now we are really focusing for the AMR in the public culture also, especially the students of the great systems in the pandemic in the environment. What, what do you think that uh, the purpose of the project that you uh, explained to us is uh, the mechanism of the project working like uh, not something that they have already started to introduce the plan transform that can be carried to the environment in the soil and then after that it can go inside the plant and then after that if the animal eating the plant they can get also the AMR unit to the hospital. Is it the same mechanism as the past? So yeah so I think in one of the slides that I So in one of the slides that I showed, you know, the inbred uh, title. So they, you know, ask about the transformative uh, dashboard unit. Uh, but when you are looking for for fish, uh, because let's say we are hunting for um, fish therapy, we are only looking for those fish that they call the plant. So yeah, so uh, in the, the other aspect that we were talking in the uh, afternoon part of what I did, I said that you know, I only the reason why there are also some research and doing research on how can we use space as a kind of transport, you know, like a transport for the disease. And also that's also one of the things that we want now that on the flip side, some things can also spread as a microbial disease can spread if they have this type of disease. But the ones that we are interested in uh, for uh, for fish therapy is those two. Okay, space out time. Okay, so you can enter the pin four one three two four. It's a multiple choice question. So, which of the following is not a characteristic of fish? <laughs> so, fishes are obligate in the cellular bacterial parasite. Fishes are considered one of the most abundant organisms on Earth. Characterization is mainly based on morphology and nucleic acid composition. And fishes have a wide host range of genetic and several mineral bacteria. And the correct answer is pages have a wide host range and can infect several genera of bacteria. Just so Justy is leading. The next question. So this is a true or false question. The RNA fish levy virus is an example of a phenospecific specific fish. True or false? <laughs> Okay, let's up 
think so currently PT is leading. And the last question that will decide who will be the champion. Which of the following alternatives can be used for both root promotion and disease treatment? Is it vaccine, bacteriophage, probiotics, or immune modulator? So now, the exciting point, third place, Casey, Yay. second place, Ao, and the champion, <laughs> congratulations to Piti. Nano materials and environment to be held or 
also started that form, environmental issues, but also health and economical threats in many parts of the world. And then in the region, uh, we worked with the sector like health community and bring both health and environment communities together to encourage them to highlight this as one of the, the priority environmental and, and health issues at the level of the region Pacific through the regional forum on health and environment for Asian Pacific. And because they highlight the MMR as one of the major environmental health issues in their Manila declaration, in their declaration in 2016, we, we have started successfully to mobilize environment sector together with our sector to start at least <coughs> talking about MMR as a problem and also environment communities to be worried about. And then earlier this year, we uh, established a documentation called Global Chemicals Outlook. This is the, the maybe the biggest chemical release assessment we do uh, as and our partners around the world because we do it every five years or so. And this is considered to be one of the major global reference documents when we talk about where we are in chemical management in the world. We had a round of uh, regional contributions and we got a lot of support that implemented our sister agency, WHO, WHO. Make sure that the experts in the region who participate in this global assessment push for MR to be a major priority of the region. And because of that, uh, the coverage of MR and also pharmaceutical contamination in general really increased in this round of global assessment compared to the one we did. And there was a lot of uh, analysis on the pharmaceutical contamination to begin with. I'm not going yet to AMI specific because there's not great information there, but at least through this global chemical outlook too. These are the contamination of pharmaceutical in the environment is alarming. There are major sources of uh, emissions to the sea, right? Drug manufacturer. Pharmaceutical uh, medicine manufacturer seems to be their location of manufacturing seems to be one of the hotspots of the contamination source. Another one is the patient animal species excretion. And when the discharge is happening, it is another hotspot of contamination. And lastly but not least, the inadequate use and of pharmaceuticals intentionally or unintentionally, this seems to be also a very important source of uh, uh, emissions and some sources of hotspots. And then uh, the report also points out that the wastewater management and storage waste management all over the world, with priority to exception, is completely also inadequate to clean up any of the information about pharmaceutical contamination when it is around. And lastly but not the least, we say that there are now more studies globally checking the level of the contamination around the world. And we highlight three studies, but one of the, the studies I would like to, to inform you about is there was a JAMA Environment Agency study they look at that 71 countries in all the region, not only in North America and, and Europe, but all the regions in, uh, in the world, and found the more than 600 active pharmaceutical pollutants in the environment, and even in the surface water, groundwater, tap water, and drinking water. So basically, what we can tell them is that with medicines, pharmaceuticals, are everywhere when we are being exposed to it. And this map shows, this is a very interesting. 
thing. The story describes the order having scars and all the same body, uh, and also a uh, adaptation of the, the particular analogy for the jungle of the flower is true. Basically, if you can look at even the country that comes from the man, the man is considered to be having quite decent wastewater system or safety or capability. But if you see it in a peak, that may at least let medium level of uh, numbers of farmers to still be go about in the environment, nature, drinking water, hot water. Okay? So that means that even when you have quite efficient <coughs> the capability of that system could be out um, to people contamination once it's already in the environment is very limited. And if this is so, you do not really have a robust wastewater treatment, which is majority of the yeah, majority of the case, unfortunately, in Indonesia. Now, coming to AMR contamination, AMR presence. Natural environment. I also have it here that these years, more recent years, we are starting to find more and more studies actually done in developing countries in Asia to show what is the presence of AMR in the environment, natural environment, water bodies, and so on and so forth. So, this is one of the from India uh, by Samantha and Sam uh, this year. They look at the water body in India, the major river system like Ganga, Siamura, and basically they say that as you go down to the, 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 the discharge part of the river basin, the closest to, to the exit point, the river mouth, you have a very, very high presence of MR bacteria. In one river called the Kaudari River in Karnataka, 100%. What is the scientific validation of the point? I think the doctor, maybe you don't know which drug to use. Sorry, I don't know how common is this drug, but uh, really in seeing me now, I think it's quite a common uh, element. Uh, so, this is the situation. And I'm not really surprised because uh, I was at the pollution officer. So, I look at anything that you don't want to in your environment or in your body. Uh, pollution, uh, water pollution, plastic pollution, uh, I see them. And I try to see where those pollution comes from. So I have had my share of visits to wastewater treatment facilities where it exists. All the, the landfill waste dumps. We are seeing in this region is really poor. Identify more 
and try to be where the heart is going. And try as much as possible that point for to be seen, controlled, reduce the distance from those areas, at least to reduce the impact. Because once it's reduced to environment, it's very difficult to, to recover or try to contain that in large areas because of technological problems and the situation of the disability domain of the country. This is very much mirroring another pollution problem which is very hot among the environment community at this moment, microplastics. Microplastics is one of the problems, also it's everywhere now. We know the drinking water of the ICD almost likely contains some amount of microplastics. But thanks to the very few of the weather, it's deeply safe. Um, there is no major impact on health. So, you know, if you are a newborn uh, baby or elderly person, uh, you get the impact on any item are different, depends on how susceptible you are to different conditions. So, microplastic also, what we try to do is contain from the source, try to reduce the source of the emission as much as possible, remove the root causes, because once microplastic is in an environment, trying to recover them or reduce the contamination there, right? So the most effective way to try to reduce the source is just to clean away. So, what we done? We continue to celebrate AMR Awareness Week. It's our responsibility to bring more attention on this subject to the environment community. As we have done through the launch of Global Chemical Outlook 2, I will meet you in Nairobi as part of the UN Environment Assembly in preparation. We will continue to strengthen our collaboration with other entities through Body Strike, the regional forum on the environment for Asian species. The, this regional forum uh, has just handed over the responsible task. So next uh, five years, Indonesia will be host country of the regional forum on the environment, and we will work with them particularly, but also all other 15 countries or metropolitan area of this regional forum to highlight the topics such as the mark as a priority for this region. And with the Nairobi and other communities of the, the animal health, definitely I think work together to create more, more emphasis on identifying where the root cause comes from. As the environment community, there has the responsibility of pollution control. We have to do more on promoting data collection in the environment, how much of the MR exists in this water body, this soil, this area in our environment. And lastly but not least,
Presentation. I think I can remember almost what I was doing, so maybe I can introduce myself. Um, I've been working in WASH for 20, 25 years, and before that, I was actually working in irrigation. Um, so, we do have an agricultural link. I've been with WHO for about 10 years now, working on water safety, uh, planning, and now on sanitation and water planning. Um, I think maybe before starting, just a little bit of background about WHO and WASH and how this sort of links in with, with FAO. WHO has been working in WASH for 16 years, pretty much ever since it was formed. In the early days, it used to get significant funding to implement. Uh, Water supply schemes and sanitation schemes. But infrastructure was very expensive and it was not seen as a use for WHO at the time. So increasingly, WHO's work has been very much involved in technical expertise, scientific expertise. It's um, drinking water quality guidelines, it's very much as well a reference to health countries in defining what are safe standards for water supply in their own countries. So Coco was mentioning this morning that there are some doubts as to quite how safe this may be. WHO is constantly working with experts around the world, collecting information, and they have high-level expert panels to advise them on every single emerging issue that is going to be. Whether it's pesticides, whether it's microplastics, whether it's effective biotic residues, there are so many things going into the environment and into our water supply. It's really hard to keep track. So it's constantly updating its advice and its uh, advising on the inside. So WHO has a lot of work. Now a lot of its work is in supporting countries in terms of developing regulations, in terms of providing tools for dealing with different areas of watch. And some of these tools increasingly through our One Health relationship some of these ideas that have been developed within the human sector may be quite applicable within the agricultural sector. So I'm thinking about going forward, uh, looking at the areas of infection prevention and control. Again, the Cooper mentioned this morning about trying to control at source the amount of residues and uh, resistance that is in the environment and is being moved around. So under the Global Action Plan for Antimicrobial Resistance, one of the five strategic objectives is infection prevention and control. So it's stopping people from getting sick in the first place and needing antibiotics. So again, this is something which is very relevant within the agricultural sector. So we're going to try and test whether this works. Perfect. Okay. So 19th of November was a very important day for us. Does any of you happen to know why? Not you, Jim. Here's one clue. Ah, you expert. There we go, there's another clue. Uh, um, congratulations, you get a new car. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of quite a day. And in fact, I don't know whether it's by design or by happy coincidence. World Quality Day coincides with uh, antibiotic awareness. Maybe it's only this year because the wind will constantly change. I think it's a happy coincidence. But anyway, they are the same time of year. So it's a very uh, timely moment to sort of realize. 
realize the link between sanitation in particular and waste water and um, AMR. Wash is quite a, a wide subject. In its simplest form, it's a collective term for water supply, for sanitation, and for hygiene. They're put together because they are very much interdependent. They have an influence on each other. So, for example, without toilets and confining uh, human waste within toilet water sources, become very easily contaminated. Without clean water, basic hygiene practices are not possible. So it's all very much interlinked. Water supply is about access to safe and drinking water. Sanitation is about access to and hygiene is about the same as toilets. Plus, ways to separate human waste from contact with people. And then hygiene is about good hygiene practices, especially hand washing and soap. But it does extend further than this, and I will explain later. One of the big areas where WHO works within WASH now is working jointly with UNICEF and the Joint Monitoring Program. So it's monitoring global progress on achieving safe drinking water, safe in mind, sanitation, and so forth. So it's been needed. But just a little bit really about how WASH fits into the SDGs. It's under SDG 206. About ensuring availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. So, the main targets that we are concerned with are 6 1 for drinking water, 6 2 for sanitation and hygiene. Both of these are monitored by WHO and UNICEF. Uh, and the third one is water quality, specifically wastewater quality, and is monitored by WHO. Well, just a little bit of information about these targets. So, safe drinking water is the population using safely managed drinking water services. And the indicators are that they are located on premises, so in terms of accessibility, having good supply close to you, that it's available when needed, and it's free of fecal and viral chemical contaminants, so the bad quality. The MDGs were very much about access. And now, the focus is much more on quality. In terms of sanitation, the indicator is about population using safely managed sanitation services, including hand washing facilities, soap, and water pumps. These facilities should be not shared. In many parts of the world, many families may share the same facilities. It's not a problem. The discrete that are safely disposed of in situ or transported and treated off site. And then the third one is about safely treating all citizens. So again, this is very much linked to Kukuko's presentation before about minimizing the release of hazardous chemicals and materials. And the target is a hard proportion of untreated surfaces. Although as we've seen in the case of pharmaceuticals, many new treatment options uh, need to be found. So the indicator there is Wastewater that is safe and treated. This is really how safely managed sanitation services are looked. I'm glad I'm not the first person this morning to have mentioned that word. Um, but uh, many places now, ship flow diagrams are really being used to look at uh, how uh, human, this is for human waste, is contained, emptied, transported, treated and either reused or disposed. So there are many cities, many countries, many locations around the world, around the world that have been creating these ship flow diagrams. And they help us to identify the proportion of wastewater that is safely managed. You will see from this diagram that really pretty much to be safely managed, it needs to have gone through the treatment process. The treatment does not necessarily mean that it will be safely they may be not effectively treated, and, uh, they may be um, safely abandoned. An awful lot of wastewater treatment plants that do not work very well. So, the different types of systems for normal sewage systems, for on site facilities, uh, with septic tanks and off site disposal, or with open desiccation, uh, just by emptying and discharging a lot goes into the domestic environment or into the agricultural field. So what does WASH cover within different, different contexts? First of all, looking at uh, communities, water supply is very much about 
has not yet been linked to quality. Um, and now is really the time. But this first diagram really is a summary of the data that is coming. And I think it's quite helpful for WASH and goes to link to the environment. The environment is really going on to this. It was, it is the receiving body of so much of the land. But it's also the place where most of the selection and the transfer of resistance happens. So it does need huge attention. Of course, there is the native resistance, and this is now natural. So it's been heavily accelerated. Infection control is what we are left with when we have drug resistance pathogens or mild drug resistance pathogens. What we have here is pretty much the environment, what they like to call the organism disease, which I think is quite nice. And this is where Ideal drug uh, condition, selection, uh, and cell density in contact and horizontal gene transfer. This is where so much of the action happens. What we need to try and do is to change that recipe for that organism or soup by looking at how we can prevent these added waste from these areas going into this and reducing the uh, chance of uh, selection and transfer. So much selection and transfer happens in and on and in human. But the general theory from the symposium is that the vast majority actually happens in human. Um, and then this is just yeah, a brief uh, summary from me. Any previous guys that were obviously just got in my head is antibiotics in people and in animals, hospitals, uh, communities, sewage systems, farm waste, into the environment, from the environment. Again, WASH in this context has a big role to play in changing the, the recipe uh, of the organismal soup through rainwater treatment, but also actually in this area, ensuring that the water we receive is in service. Or we go. This is a paper that was in the British Medical Journal Supplement on uh, AMR resistance in New England. Um, I mentioned it yesterday. Very interesting publication which covers all sorts of aspects of antimicrobial resistance in the Southeast Asia uh, uh, region. Um, and we can certainly provide you a link. But really, it was looking at the, the, the relative risk of um, selection and, and transfer within humans, within the environment, within animals, and the level of risk between those sectors and where data was. And this is a summary diagram, and this is a very detailed table that looks at so many of those areas of problem. And we are currently working uh, with UNEF and with others uh, to try and develop a risk framework to help countries to prioritize, identify where the high risk areas are, where they should be focusing their response. We mentioned that AMR is everywhere, but countries cannot spend money on everything, and really it's to identify based on that element where they should be prioritizing their investments. And again, watch very much in terms of between humans and the environment, in terms of wastewater, in terms of sanitation, in terms of water supply, it's extremely important. So a little bit about the response. Um, and WH at the moment is really very much focusing on healthcare systems. Very many reasons for that. Part of the um, Sustainable Development Goals is for access to universal health care systems. And it's been very much recognized by that the health sector now, the IPC has morphed to a really important part of achieving universal health care. Without this, you're not going to achieve universal health care. So they have been working uh, on steps to achieve universal access to quality care and have developed a tool for management. Um, healthcare facilities. Now, these are kinds of approaches and tools that may be of interest in the agriculture sector moving forward. So, looking at what steps to take, process to go through, and looking at management of facilities to reduce the risk of infection. So, in terms of the practical steps, there are eight steps that are presented. In the interest of time, I won't go through them here. 
And that's, things are all unavailable on the website, downloadable, and the watch fix tool with the risk management tool is an interesting one. It is very ensuring that within a facility, there are dedicated people with responsibility for accessing the watch, that uh, the facilities are assessed, the risks identified and managed, and that they are continuously evaluated. Okay, I've got some thoughts really linked to uh, before Joy comes in and speaks. Just really some three slides really on uh, watch in agriculture. So water supply is a carrier of antimicrobials and residues as an input to the agriculture of Water supply in many cases may take wastewater. This is estimated that 65% of all the irrigated areas are less than 40 kilometers downstream of urban centers. By wastewater. So sanitation, this is the output of the agricultural production process. This is the waste and waste wastewater uh, from livestock rearing or from aquaculture. And then on the hygiene side, remember that this includes waste management and environmental cleaning. Many of those uh, relationships there in terms of biosecurity measures. Measures not only in intensive livestock production systems, but certainly at an extremely important part of intensive livestock production. This is just to highlight something that is, about, is in process at the moment from Dudley Hill is a wash and AMR policy brief. So, this is meant to be at a high level, this 10 page summary document providing advice to governments um, on. Wash and AMR. So the first part, action area, is what's called in this leadership. And then there are technical areas in communities, in healthcare facilities, uh, in agriculture and food production, and in the manufacturing of ethanol fluids. And then again, a common action area sits on surveillance and research. For well, each of these action areas, um, what is being looked at is um, co benefits and evidence related to that particular subject, and then actions that can be taken uh, going forward. So we're sharing with the countries in the region to identify whether these uh, issues are accurate for the country in which they are in, whether it needs updating to their particular um, cases, and then moving forward. So this, so this is now a very nice opportunity for the agriculture sector to engage uh, within this wider watch debate, and certainly we are working with our partners at OIT and FAO in this area to try and take this forward. But there will be a chance for all experts uh, in this region to um, contribute to this process, and of course, we'll be sharing information. So that's kind of the human health side. Environment healthy 
and lastly on hygiene, which is a set of personal practices that contribute to good health. So basically the key components um, in that backbone of acid wash. So it's clean water and heat, clean and safe water and heat, sanitation, which you'll be looking at tools and systems, and also hygiene. Next year, there's a lot of the work that we've been doing down on Agriwa. So there's 
try to put up the expert in terms of the farmers and farmers, and of course, social issues, anthropology, and all the others. So, I think this is just a brief summary of what will be taking place for the next, uh, for the next year on the Action Watch. Uh, with that,
Thank you very much for this talk. Uh, and uh, this is Alex. So I think you can put a lot of things from yesterday. So today I will give, uh, will give the presentation um, in a minute. Uh, so I'm just going to introduce just the um, uh, Um, I think you 
my familiar with this graph, the Navier release, release a whole bunch of plans in 2016 and identified basically four, four focus areas, which, is, which are awareness, uh, evidence, surveillance, and good practices. I think we have observed the program made in, a, in a, many, I mean, programs made in a, in a first three components, but we have to little on this component, the good practices part. And so that, that Give us the idea that we, we have to do something for at least on the regional level and also the global level to emphasize the importance of good practices for AIM and so on in the land of AMR. So that's the, the activity or um, uh, research. That was kind of a program. Uh, the, the, the ALA is done by uh, IPO and our partner, Liverpool University, to conduct the study.
in that in that form, the other importance of providing AMR awareness towards contamination and inclusion of AMR in veterinary and medical, both human and animal health perspective, the inclusion of AMR in the background, and also to build a comment, uh, uh, community of practices, including veterinarians, uh, medical doctors, and all the, all the other disciplines. And here, I think the idea of the presentation will be available online if you're interested in Barat. Um, next one, I think the second name is a bit long, it's like Kofi Bar, actually. This is a Vietnamese platform for AMR reduction in chicken production. Actually, they showed their success, showed a, a successful intervention to reduce the AAQ in a small scale farms by uh, promoting these four components farm training, uh, farm health plan, and uh, the use of uh, alternatives and diagnostics. So the third one I'm going to share here is uh, from China, and although the link is not available, but we can if you, there if you have any questions you want to know more detail, you can reach out to me. Um, and uh, they they use herbal medicine, it's kind of like typical thing from from, from China, but as an alternative, alternative uh, as an alternative to animal eggs. They categorize the chickens in different stages of ages, and by uh, with, with different pur uh, purposes, uh, and use different combination of Herbal medicines to, to uh, replace uh, the use of antibiotics in the farm. So actually, I'm personally, I'm, I think this, this one is very interesting from my from my side. It's a free zone biosecurity shared by FAO Hectare um, Indonesia teams. Uh, they carried it out in Indonesia. So this is the farm. Uh, how this looks like. The free zone is like the red zone. Um, um, yellow zone and green zone. So red zone is like dirty zone. So there, there will be contamination. You're handling things over there. And then it's the yellow zone, the buffer zone. So it's kind of like you, you, you. There's, I mean, it's just buffer thing between the green, uh, then, uh, between the red and green. Green is the clean zone. So by using these kind of strategy uh, in poultry farms, here's the data. So compared to the non greedy Last pretty group, the use, the amount of use of antibiotics in the in the this region of security group showed a forty six percent increase in antibiotic use compared to the next in control group. And also, not only for that, there's also a significant mean increase in the productivity in a, in the later heads. So we can see that for additional income per day per day pump, the three zone of security. $72 per day increase, and on, on, on the other hand, the control group showed a decrease of $36 per day. And I would like to also take this opportunity to share more information on our two publications uh, released by our uh, HQ headquarters. First is Denmark Experience, it's also available online. And the three parts I would like to mention here is first is the database called BestSet. This is the database that was launched in 2000. Real-time data on all sales of fruit, uh, fruit scraps and medicine uh, for production animals at both farm and species level. That was like species, there are many of them, including cattle, small ruminants, pigs, poultry, aquaculture, fur animals, and even toddlers. So I think this is quite easy to understand. There's a veterinary veterinary services contract, which is like the veterinarians, the group who are associated with the This one's yellow card initiative that India announced in this year is from the developer. It's a yellow card, it's like a warning, and next time you've got a green card, you're out of the game. So what it what is that is the yellow card actually said that I think when they're 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 studying realize um um uh, this data database reviewed a wide a wide variation in environmental and consumption for different farms. So some of the farms Use lower level antibiotics, and some farms are really high. So those the highest level of antibiotic consumption in the farm, they gave them yellow card at the beginning. So it showed you that you will have to immediately use the antibiotics in your farm, and otherwise you'll be fine anyway. Um, 
so the last point of publication is based on the releases for the protocol and then it's in the use of academic availability in case and, and for three. They, they interview how to use academic antibiotics in a prudent and medical and efficient way, and also given the idea that practical recommendations are how to combine prudently with the preventive or cautious measures for good uh, productivity. And uh, it listed the uh, general strategy for how to use antibiotics in, uh, in poultry and pig farm. And this is one of the bigger that I have. It's very interesting for my side. Uh, so here is the key elements um, of the holistic animal, animal health management, including food, uh, animal, uh, animal husbandry, including infection, biosecurity, so development and vaccination, and all the good uh, and medical efficient use of antibiotics. Here is also the link. Uh, I think this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.
coming back to this point, you know, I want to give you an example in four different settings, uh, four different countries. Small example, Laos, India, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Uh, in Laos, it's a very small little backyard for the And the aim is to improve food health and production. In Myanmar, the production system is uh, it is small holder, but it's sort of small to medium scale. It's organized into what is called a food production zone. So these are designated areas where there are poultry farms ranging from maybe 500 birds to 500,000 birds, or maybe even more. And how do we get those practices in those big poultry production zones? In Cambodia, the focus of the project is on improving biosafety. So, at where food is slaughtered and sold. And live bird markets are common throughout uh, Asia. You know, some are large, some are small, but you will find them in every country. There are very few countries uh, like Thailand where any live bird market exists. In most of the other countries, it happens in these small, medium sized live bird markets. So, how do we make sure that good practices? And then in Vietnam, the focus is on improving uh, the practices, uh, specifically in small scale hatcheries in the northern province of Bac district, in northern Vietnam. And this is the province where hatchery production has really boomed over the last five years. And a lot of new players are entering into the hatchery production sector. And these hatcheries are then supplying their own food to the entire Vietnam, the value chain is connected to us. So it's at the base of the pyramid of the poultry production cycle. So if you improve practices there, get those good practices and reduce risk of infection, diseases, and AMR there, translates down the value chain. So in, in Vietnam, I'll start with Vietnam, the objectives of the project were to improve these practices. The idea was to support a hatchery certification scheme and link it to the good animal hygienist practices. Now, last year in GHG, it's very well developed for the commercial sector, but there are no guidelines in there for the small scale farms. So, what was uh, the approach that there should be an auditing and certification scheme which should be developed for the small scale hatcheries? The hatchery should be certified. Outside the province, allowing them a better access to a wider market, and at the same time, having their certificates will allow them to have more money for their products because they say, Oh, my product is certified, so I can get more money. So, the idea was number one, to improve the infrastructure, and I'm not going to go into the very uh, examples. Uh, then, improve practices. Know, whether you are cleaning, whether you are disinfecting, changing water, um, cleaning the shops, uh, improving hatching practices that includes uh, collecting the eggs fast, faster, making sure that they are clean, removing the cracked eggs faster, improving egg storage, uh, waste management, and this links to what David said earlier. You know, some of my colleagues earlier talked about using alternative. Medicines for probiotics, doing aerobic composting, which we know uh, has been known to reduce uh, AMR. So, some of these practices were uh, introduced to the hatchery farmers. Um, behavior change was emphasized. At the same time, a lot of training was done, but even though you do training, it's not easy to bring about the behavior change. So, at the end of it, after four, five, six months, what happened was um, there were some model farms which were selected, and these model farms became like champions of change or champions of good practices. And now you see <coughs> how beautiful the farms are. <coughs> and then at the end of these six months, there was a cost benefit analysis done. So 
before and after. And what was found that in these uh, as we found, uh, these good practices resulted in reducing medical and social factors for It improved hatchability, uh, laying rate by 10% and hatchability by 2 to 5 Now, this calculated this yearly good profit for the farm. And then after that, uh, these farmers were given a certificate that we are good farms or good practicing farms. And that certificate enabled them to sell their products outside the product to be able to show a lot of So they got a wider market access. Similarly, for broiler farm courses, a lot of benefits were identified. And if you look here, these, these two farmers are model farmers and they basically practice. So what was done was that open farm days were organized. Farmers from different provinces came, visited their farms, and they learned about the benefits, the economic benefits of doing these good practices. And that is the best way to promote good practices. And the emphasis doesn't necessarily need to be on producing antibiotics users, but it has to be on good practices, good biosurgical practices, good production practices. Then, so that was an example of the environment. Then I will take an example of uh, so that is an example of the Now in Myanmar, in the young one poultry production zone, this was a this was an approach of uh, let's say public private farmers. Some of the um, more proactive poultry farmers they got together and they said we want to produce eggs without uh, from hens to because uh, young corn is a newly um, uh, developing country, there is a huge market which is open to that, and there is a demand for eggs which are produced without antibiotics. So they realized that nobody in the country was actually producing them. So um, there was this uh, farmer group which was formed, which was called like, the Healthier Production Group or the HP group. And what the for farmers did was that they explored how do we produce these eggs, you know, do we certify the eggs as sweet, does the process have to be certified as sweet, so they approached this local NGO, which is called the Myanmar Organic Agriculture, who said that we will provide you with guidelines and with directions on how to improve eggs. So Moag gave them guidelines, they made this regular audit, auditing of their farms and they certified that these farms are following a good process of producing eggs without antibiotics. At the same time, the eggs were tested by the Veterinary Assay Lab and this is the government <coughs> lab. So it was a partnership between the government agency, the NGOs and the farmer groups. Then the farmer groups wanted to find They went to a supermarket, so you, you look at city mark supermarket, which is one of the largest chains in, in Myanmar. And they said, we want to bring to you these uh, antibiotics for these two eggs. Uh, they negotiated a better, better price for them. So it was a win win situation you know, for the farmers as well as for the supermarket. The supermarket got um, um, shelf space available for the farmers, they displayed their eggs there. They branding, the logo development, and the farmers were very happy because they identified uh, economic incentives in what they were doing. And now this HPD group, which started with three farmers, it, it has grown to four farmers, five farmers, six farmers. There are more farmers who want to join. And eventually there will be a reduction in price, but still the market will become larger. So that's another way of incentivizing good practices by finding these Unique marketing opportunities. Um, in South India, uh, I will give an example of the Rakaban province. There, um, the it's it's small village level production. Now these small villages in Guangaban provinces, province who produce poultry, suddenly realize that there is a big market in Luangkabang because Luangkabang is very attractive tourist destination. 
and they all want to produce more food, there is a preference in the consumer for native breeds. The problem with the native breeds of poultry is that they are slow growing, uh, they don't uh, you know, take up to six months for them to attain a maximum body weight. The villagers don't know how to give them proper feed and nutrition, and if somebody comes from the contract farming side, So the problem is uh, the farmers do not really think of the best practice. So how do you encourage farmers to follow these practices and get the best practice? Another innovative approach that we've tried was that of the development of the commercial and related chicken and brand based products. So a native breed of chicken was selected, uh, which has better growing potential, which survives on <coughs> Local uh, plants available, local seeds available, and a farmer group was formed of 54 farmers in three villages, and they said the new way to raise your uh, chickens in a free range system, you will not use any uh, antibiotics, you will only uh, feed them with nature, grass, and mulberry, and then these things are natural um, pig fighting. And you sell your chicks, uh, your chickens as happy chicks, healthy chicks. And so these farmer groups were established, model farms were established. The model farmers started producing day old chicks and supplying to the farmer groups. So the size progressively grew. Then there was a brand promotion which was organized. So this brand, brand promotion included a cooking competition where recipes were And then they took them to the night market to go out the farms for the consumer preference based uh, test, which was done uh, with the tourists, with the local hotels operating there. And there was good visibility of this brand as well as it's promoted. So now, what happened with those uh, promotion events was that there was a huge amount of interest in this race and this group of chicken. And now the farmers have been motivated. Using the local, environmentally sustainable, eco-friendly practices to produce these chicks, and they don't want to use antibiotics anymore. They will go, you know, the contract farmer will go and they sell their loads, and they say, "No, sorry, please leave the chick with our chicken. We want to raise it to the elite of chicken, and they get a better price for it." That's what sustainable farming. Um, then I will give you an example of Cambodia. So now this. In this region, there is a huge preference for freshly slaughtered chicken. And if the chicken is not slaughtered in a good manner, then there is a risk of uh, infectious disease transmission, AMR transmission to the slaughterers and then onwards to the feed. So look at this. These, these are the sort of practices that are being followed by livestock farmers. So we try to improve practices within that life. Improve animal welfare standards, improve slaughter standards. And look at the farming practices. Half of the traders were slaughtering chicks first. Many of them were selling unhealthy or dead food. So the focus was on improving these practices along the value chain. And then improving uh, legislation which are uh, related to food security. Two of the legislation which were amended were that uh, first poultry should be held for two hours by <coughs> so there is an inspector who makes sure that each poultry is not being slaughtered. And then there was a ban on force feeding of poultry. So people were forced to eat poultry so that uh, the body would increase as well. They would use the same tool to feed one poultry to one tool to another to feed the body of the other one as well. So these two legislations were. And then uh, a lot of trainings were done of the uh, slaughterers and then there was the rest. There was a women's group of slaughterers which was established because 80% of the slaughterers in that life were not were women. And they were trained on following good practices for women slaughter, for animal welfare, for cover.
padre in the food, uh, the father in the food. A lot of reference was done about good hygiene practices and sort of hand washing for all the disposal of waste water. Now, the next step is to build a new market with improved uh, waste disposal, uh, disposal uh, facilities, water management facilities, carcass disposal facilities. So, all these will result into a model life world market with good practices being followed and good operational systems being applied in that market. So, to take four examples, uh, none of these are related directly to CMRP. At the same time, by implementing good practices, uh, following good hygiene standards, and most importantly, identifying economic incentives for the different sectors of production systems that operate in the country. The small scale, the very uh, backyard based level, the medium scale, and the transition sector, where the risks are probably the highest. Um, those can go a long way.